This Sunday on Capital Connection, Speaker Welch won't catch up to Speaker Madigan's longest tenured run in that office, why he set term limits on himself and the Republican leader. This is historic, what we're doing today. Term limits on the Speaker of the House and the minority leader. Plus, the next time the House meets, it won't be in the State House, but online, perhaps on Zoom. What took the House so long to catch up with the Senate? Change does not happen overnight. It's a process. We can debate and vote on bills uh, remotely during this pandemic. Plus, a flurry of new bills, new committee assignments, and the legislature back in session, if you will, even if it's virtual. Plus, a sneak peek of what's to come in Governor Pritzker's virtual, remote, state of the state and budget address next Wednesday. House Democrat Ann Williams and House Republican Mike Marin join us. It's all coming up on Capital Connection. From the Illinois State Capitol Rotunda, Capitol Bureau Chief Mark Maxwell is asking the tough questions. This is Capital Connection. Welcome to Capital Connection. I'm Mark Maxwell reporting from the Illinois State House on this Sunday, February 14. Happy Valentine's Day to you. Former House Speaker Michael Madigan's record run as the longest tenured speaker in Illinois history is safe for now. His successor, new Speaker Chris Welch, voted to approve rules this Wednesday that would cap a speaker's term to just 10 years. Five consecutive two-year terms is the max any speaker or minority leader can serve in Illinois moving forward as long as these rules are in place. I think the biggest thing is, is we've now put term limits on the speaker and the minority leader of five general assemblies or 10 years. I think the biggest change uh, that people will notice is that there's actually term limits for the speaker and the majority leader or the minority leader. When it's in rules, uh, it's easy easier to get around it than it is if it's in statute or really if it's in the Constitution. But I think the best avenue for us to go down right now would be to pass legislation that would put it in statute to have it affect um, both the House and the Senate to have it um, as a law instead of in the rules. The new rules also bring the House up to speed with the Senate and allow members to go online to do their work like so many Americans have done during this pandemic. Starting immediately, House committees can hold hearings online and can advance legislation to the full House as if they were there at the committee in person, all of it done remotely, that allowing lawmakers to keep their distance while they keep up with their work. It's allowing us to get back to work, having remote committee meetings, committee votes. This is something we should have been doing last year. We're getting back to work. There's a lot of important things that need to be done to help the community, help the state, and we're going to get to work and do it. Do we have a very precarious budget situation? We've got things we got to deal with um, as far as COVID is concerned. And so just getting back to the work of the people, it's exciting to me. If it's remote, it's remote. Uh, if it's in person, it's in person, but we've got to get it done. In other words, the legislature is back, and many members hope that the State House can reassert itself as an equal branch of government, the legislative with the executive. For example, one of the hearings we might start to hear more of from Democrats and Republicans alike, complaints about backlogs at the Department of Employment Security where so many claims for jobless benefits have gone unheard and ignored. None of us are happy with what's going on. Um, a majority of my time, even when I was able to take a break fr from here because of COVID, I was going to work on heavy bills that I, was, I have in mind. But none of that could happen because I was so focused on IDES mm. and was unable to get an answer. And that made me as a legislator feel some type of way. So now that we're back to work, we could have a subject matter so he could tell us, everyone, what's going on, going on and why, aren't, why are people getting their checks when they need to. Also, the State House can get to work trying to balance the budget. One Democrat did not agree necessarily with all of Governor Pritzker's ideas that he laid out in a sneak peek of his budget address that is still to come this Wednesday. That speech will be delivered virtually. Governor Pritzker in his office telling us this week there will be no new taxes in his plan. But will the State House have other ideas? That's unfortunate um, that the governor's budget doesn't prioritize education probably in the way it should to make sure that we are putting new money into the education formulas. We need to put new dollars into the formula, not just flat funded. So 
some of our decisions as a legislature will be what we think the priorities are budget-wise. Regardless of what the governor has said in terms of what he wants to do, we have some ability to do that as well. And if we're able to figure out how to put new dollars into the school funding formula, then I dare the governor to veto that money out and bring us back to flat funding. Whether it was jobless benefits, executive power, education funding, or any other number of disagreements, you name it, the executive and legislative branches have a lot of points of contention or disagreement in recent days, and we very well may see some of those debates emerging in this new year with a new cast of members in the State House. Governor Pritzker on thin ice with the legislature these days, reluctant to force them back to a joint session to listen to his State of the State address and offering them an olive branch, granting the request from several members to allow them to move up in the line to get their vaccine. The governor says he'll wait his turn. But on Wednesday, when the House returned to session, many of those members got to go to a special secure location, a private pop-up clinic set up just for them, where they could go get their first doses of the vaccine after the governor moved them up in the line. If you qualify, you should get the vaccine, and if you don't, you don't. And that's what I'm following. That includes Monica, that includes you. That includes me. Did you get your vaccine already? I think that's a hippie thing that I shouldn't talk about because I don't want to put other legislators on the spot. But I can tell you this, that I'm following the law. And, and what's the argument for that, for lawmakers getting the vaccination? Um, I think that the argument for it is so that we can come in here and do the people's work. You mentioned vaccination. Yeah. Have you been vaccinated yet? Uh, working on it. Today? Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, well, I actually would rather not bring that up. <laughs> well, maybe you might rather not, but there are people that are asking, yeah. should lawmakers jump into this phase 1B? I hear you. Uh, well, yeah, what's the argument for it? Well, for almost a year, we were not here. And a lot of things were either put on the, on the back burner or rushed through during lame duck. And it made everyone mad, the things that were rushed through during lame duck. And so now we're telling people, hey, we've been working on this since the summer, but we never came back to Springfield to work. So uh, making sure that legislators are vaccinated, it helps us to get back to work for the people in Illinois. So while some people feel that we shouldn't be given any particular treatment or preferential treatment, if you will, but this is the operations of the state. Hopefully we get to the point where we're prioritizing teachers so we can get them back into the classrooms. But if this is, you know, the operations of the state of Illinois, then this is a group that probably should have some ability to get a vaccine in an appropriate group so that we can come back to work and work on behalf of the people of the state of Illinois. House Republican Mike Marin joins us later, but when we come back, first House Democrat Ann Williams, the sponsor of the Clean Energy Jobs Act. What would it mean for nuclear energy, for gas, for oil, for the economy? All those questions coming up.